Yeah, Donovan. <laughs> Thank you, Mia. Um, uh, Ted was here a couple nights ago for the screening, and, and uh, it was interesting because he had never seen the film previous to that night. Uh, and, and he made the comment that he actually didn't remember some of the people that uh, well, the program. After the screening, he spent the, a good two hours telling everybody he met that he didn't remember Matthew, but then the next day he phoned me and said that everything in the film was right. Yeah. So. It's, uh, Ted is an extremely complex character that, that it's very tough to get, you know, uh, beyond his, his sort of uh, mantras in a way. Um, in making the film and getting access to him, did you ever feel like you were going to have your breakthrough with him and go, okay, we've gotten beyond his slogans and his sort of ideology? I was hoping to, but at a certain point I realized that it probably wasn't going to happen because he's just so... I guess I was always hoping there would be a breakthrough, but at one point I just sort of accepted that it's he's just sort of a very black and white thinker. And, you know, there's not much I, I could really do. <laughs> like, it's um the, the and this has come up in a number of Q and A's and and uh, the access you had to his archive, uh, which really enriches the film of actually seeing him um, perform these these you know early interventions. Um, were those tapes what you expected to see after you know reading about him and researching him for so long? When you first got to see those tapes, did they? fulfill what you already expected it happened or were there surprises within them well the tapes first of all he had um hundreds of tapes but he had a there was a fire in his house in 2006 <clears throat> so there was only about three small boxes and i i mean the tapes he filmed the tapes himself so they were shot usually within a few days of the snatching so I didn't really know what to expect. I, I, and originally, I was just hoping to find Matthew's tape. And then I ended up just finding these people. The only tapes that remained were between 1978 and 1980. And he wouldn't let me really look at them or um, because he wanted to protect the identity of the people in the tape. So I had his secretary. I got her involved, and she exhaustively called. We tried to track down these people, and then she would call them and say, can this filmmaker look at the tapes? And it was just, like, it took, like, a year and a half. And then a f just a few people said yes. Um, and a few people whose cases were more um, controversial, like Dan, like Dan Inc., he, his, there was news archives of, his, of the lawsuits. So I called, I, like, cold called him. And but the other ones, his secretary had contacted first. Did you um, were you ever concerned that consulting these people would be a trigger of sorts that you know it, it's bringing up a very sort of uh, troubling part time in their life? Uh, was there ever that concern of oh, I might be really breaking open old wounds? Well, I think no. I mean, I think I was a little naive in the beginning because when I first called Dan Ing after. She, because I cold called him because me and my camera guy Nathan, as as Ted was showing us his tapes, we were sort of like googling the names, and so I called him sort of out of the blue, not really understanding. I didn't realize he was kidnapped twice and held for fifty five days. So I was like, hey, you know, I, I'm actually at Ted Patrick's house now, and he's like, I have shivers down my spine, like it was, it was like, and then I kind of was, you know realized um, there was more to the story and he was like I, I don't think this is a really good thing for me to talk about I'm going to meditate on it and then I contacted him six months later and he said I'm not sure and then I just drove up and met him in person he lives in New Hampshire and then he agreed and also Kathy Crampton it was very traumatic for her she said um, I mean she still has a lot of post-traumatic stress disorder today so it was very difficult um, for her, but she wanted to talk about it. It's, uh, in, in a way, you're providing you know, a chance of testimony, which is a powerful tool in documentary. Um, and the film does have those, the, the, you really define it around the, the idea of lesser of two evils, of what that means when it, when it comes to society. Let's take questions from our audience, if there are any. Yes, uh, we'll go to you in the middle and then come forward. Go ahead.
yeah, how does Ted find the difference between his faith and the beliefs of those he's deprogramming? Well, he has a very like elementary way of defining it, but he's just like, you know, a church can be good or evil. And if it's good, it's good for the people. And if it's evil, it's, you're going to become a mindless robot. So he's just, <coughs> he has this kind of, like, I know that he probably has more elaborate thinking of it, but he, um, he, his most success had been with 70s Jesus cults where he could expose, because he knows the Bible inside out, where he could actually expose the contradiction in the Bible scriptures that some leaders were manipulating. Yeah. Um, but, you know, he has different, he's, he's, everything's really black and white, good or bad, right or wrong. So that's really what's very difficult. And that's sort of the flaw in Ted, you know, and why he's sort of been written out of the anti-cult history. He's just kind of a bookmark. Yeah, he's an anomaly. And is that, do you think that's just because he wasn't in academia and he wasn't, you Part, know, there's a number of factors that I think would be institutionally partly, wanting to push him out and discredit him? Partly. I mean, he started all the, like, the can of the cult awareness network. He started all the, the early cult awareness groups and then they just sort of pushed him out the more, you know, the more lot, the more he, um, the more lawsuits he, was facing and um, the more just as, as time evolved because most people started out sort of like Ted, but then they, the people would evolve their practice. So a lot of the deprogrammers that came after Ted were deprogrammed by Ted or one of his early colleagues. And then they sort of learned and refined it. And, you know, they learned how to assess situations more. And, but Ted just sort of has always, sort of been where he was in 1971. Yeah, he didn't try and progress his methodology. He started with one thing, and he just kept using yeah. the same method. But I mean, he did. He was the first person to acknowledge and predict situations like Jonestown occurring. Yeah. So, I mean, he still deserves the credit. And Yeah, he did acknowledge the symptoms that were you know, around. Um, there was a question here. Go ahead. So just on the, I guess, the racial dynamic, I mean, you have a, a, a uneducated black man from the South going around to white suburbs in the rest of the U.S. Um, I mean, you touched on it in the film, I think, a little bit. Do you, do you think really he was leveraging his sort of, his, his sort of blackness and the, the southern roots he had to kind of kind of sell himself a bit to these suburban families? Because it seems like that would be sort of potentially a point of friction if he was putting in a culture class in the 70s or one of, of, of you know, <coughs> Yeah, it's a great question because it is it is a theme in the film and not one that's hard to address fully. But it, the racial dynamics of of Ted Patrick, you know, Black Lightning, using uh, that that defining aspect of his race being a factor in these white suburban waspy families, and how much that did play into uh, his role and his ability to get hired by these families. I mean, it's hard for me to really ask that because I don't know. Like nobody's who, nobody who I spoke to really brought that up. Um, but you see it in one of the deep programmings with Steve Capolini, where he addresses black slavery and you know how he says to Steve, like you don't have to be a slave. Um, and but I he also I mean I. He's again, he just thinks he's got this mission because he also deprogrammed. Unfortunately, he couldn't tell the story. He also has a on uh, early stages of Alzheimer's, so it's difficult um, to get him to resell. But he has a story. He actually deprogrammed a daughter of a KKK member. And I was like, didn't you find that sort of strange? Did you try and deprogram the family? And he's like, he's like, no, I just charged them a bit more. <laughs> so like, he just didn't really. He's like, I will. He's like, I don't care who they are. If they're in a cult, I'll snatch them and get them out. Like, so he's just had this mission, and so, um, I mean, but he was a civil rights activist, and that's how he got hired by Ronald Reagan, Governor Reagan, sorry, to be a special representative. So he has always been kind of this sort of fighter, and um, you know, so it's definitely part of who he is. And he mentions in the film that it's it's. This, these cult leaders and these groups are not new to black people. Uh, but the people you're 
you know, the subjects who are in the film are uh, white, affluent, and intelligent. You know, the, these individuals have extreme intelligence, which makes one wonder if, if how do you brainwash someone who is so intelligent unless they do want to believe what they're being sold, right? And, and that's that's interesting now in the film of the people that it, it feels like it is a very group who are seeking out something that they're not getting, you know, on their own, right? Because they're highly inquisitive people who are looking for answers that are hard to find. Well, early on in my research, I talked to a sociologist, and I, I had this sort of assumption, like, oh, people must who get in calls must be very vulnerable and, you know, lost, and they're looking for something. And she said it's actually the opposite, because most people who aren't very strong-minded will not last. Like, during her, she infiltrated, well, she didn't infiltrate. She lived with the Moonies for, like, on and off for years in the 70s. And she noticed that people who were kind of vulnerable and weak didn't what just couldn't handle the regiment the regimented lifestyle and the commitment and they didn't have the you have to really have this sort of you know most of the people i interviewed are very intelligent and they talked about how they really believed in this ideal idealistic kind of new worlds like this that they were joining a humanitarian effort and there was something very like political in a sense and um yeah, I mean, Ted says in the interview, like, you can't hypnotize a moron. I mean, like, but he has a different way of looking at it. Um, in one interview, yeah. <laughs> where he's like, um, but a lot of people, I mean, I'm not, it's not just, like, a lot of people say that you have to, like, and also you have to kind of be able to recognize the person is, in a sense, like, an authority figure. There has to be a moment where you're like, okay, I believe that this person is um, godly or something. Well, they do speak to that idea of the charisma charismatic leader, right? Yeah. That they, you want to follow someone who does seem to embody the ideals you're looking for. Mm -hmm. um, and, and this film does really resonate today because it is, it's still present. The idea of people are seeking out uh, a belief system that gives them answers to things uh, and yeah. will go to extents past the point. And, and that's sort of the gray area of the film that's so brilliant. And, and that belief is acceptable to a certain point. And when those beliefs create actions that are detrimental to others, then society wants to rein your beliefs in. That you know, freedom of belief is okay to an extent, um, which becomes problematic. Um, we have time for one more question, if there is. Otherwise, uh, I know it is late and it's still a weekday. Um, I do want to thank all of you for coming out. Your ticket is your ballot uh, as you exit the theater. And I just want to thank Mia for bringing this fantastic film to Hot Facts. <laughs>